Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, resuming our study in verse 32. So, <clears throat> while I am reminding you all about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com, that will give you an opportunity to get your Bible and open it up to Mark chapter 1. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com that you can study the Bible with me using my audio Bible messages. Study at your pace, at your convenience. <clears throat> all you have to do is click and listen. Begin in the beginning, go all the way through the end, or study any book of the Bible you want to study. It's there for you at thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And it says, In the evening, when the sun did set, they brought to him all that were diseased and those who were possessed with devils. The word was out that Jesus could heal any disease and he had power and authority to instantly deliver the worst devil-possessed person immediately from the power of Satan. And so they came in droves to be by Jesus and it was it was the end of the Sabbath. Remember, Sabbath day was from sunset Friday until sunset Saturday. And it was against the Old Testament law to do any work on the Sabbath or to travel a very great distance on the Sabbath. And that is why the people waited until Saturday night before they brought these people to Jesus. But boy, as soon as, as, soon as uh, the sun went down, <clears throat> they brought them. In 33 it says, and all the city was gathered together at the door. All the city. What a huge crowd. It doesn't say how many, but it says all the city. So, many, many people. And it says they gathered together. And that suggests that they sat down as a group, which is right. The crowd was large. But it was not unruly. Jesus would never have tolerated rowdiness. That's never of God, my friends. God is a God of order, not of chaos, not of destruction. The Constitution of the United States gives us citizens the right to pro protest, but not to riot. Not to riot. Never. And so this was no riot, this was no mob, this was no gaggle. This was a lot of people who gathered together, but they were orderly. Jesus would not have allowed anything else. <clears throat> Verse 34, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases. So nothing stumped Jesus, you know. No sickness was too difficult for Jesus to cure. And no problem that anyone brought to him had Jesus stumped. No disease was too complicated or too advanced for him to cure. Obviously, he raised at least three people that we know of from the dead. 34 again. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and permitted not the devils to speak because they knew him. He permitted not the devils to speak. We saw this before. He did not want the testimony of the devils. He didn't want anybody to think that he was on Satan's side or in any way in league with the forces of darkness. If people were going to believe in Jesus, then he wanted it to be because of his teaching, because of the word of God that he proclaimed, and the miracles that accompanied those teachings. He did not want, nor did he need, 
the testimonies of devils, so he would not allow it. 35. <clears throat> and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Now remember, Jesus had a very busy night. Nevertheless, he was up early in the morning by himself praying. Jesus knew the best way to start any day was with prayer. The best way, certainly, for us to start any morning is with God in prayer. I hope before your feet hit the ground out of bed, you are offering to God some kind of a prayer. I know I like to say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it before my feet hit the ground. Because the best way, the most important way to start any day is with God. And some people say, well, I'm just too busy. I, I don't have time. I'm too busy to start my day with God. If you're too busy to start your day with God, then you are too busy. And you better cut something out of your life because your priorities are wrong. I know that because Jesus was super busy. Most people are busy. If you're too busy to start your day with God, you're too busy. You've got to cut something out of your life because nothing is as important as spending time with God. When people say, I'm too busy to start my day with God, that's the wrong way to look at it. So maybe you are very busy. Well, the busier one is, the more important it is for them to spend time with God, to start their day with God. And you know, God is reasonable. He knows those days when we're extremely busy. I mean, there are days that are more busy than others, right? You wake up in the morning and you think, oh, I've got this agenda. It's just kind of piled up on me. Everybody has that kind of a day. God understands. He knows those busy days. And he doesn't expect the impossible from us. And yet, at the same time, no Christian can afford to ignore him either. Not, not for a day. You can't afford to ignore God, period, at all, never, not even for one day, not even for one morning. You can't. No one should allow themselves to be too busy to talk to God, to spend time with the Lord. It's important to at least talk to Him somehow, some way. Even if you have to do it while you're driving, even if you do it while you're shaving or taking a shower or something. It, the Bible says we are to pray always, pray without ceasing. That's very important that we do that. I look at it this way. If it was important for Jesus to start his day with God, then I better do it. 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And I'm sure that after all the healing Jesus did the night before, all men were seeking for him because the population of that area was an absolute mess. The people were basket cases, possessed with devils, filled with all sorts of horrible, incurable diseases. I'm sure, I'm sure that everybody was looking for him. And I'm sure that after all the healing he did, Jesus knew that the crowds would be back with even more needs in the morning. But Jesus still made time for prayer. Again, I say to you, 
You want to be like Jesus? Well, then again, I say to you, don't let anything keep you from God. Even good things. Teaching the word of God and healing people, those were good things that Jesus was doing. But even those good things couldn't keep him from spending time with the Father in prayer. So again I say, don't let anything keep you from God, even good things. And don't let the demands of others keep you from God either. Jesus didn't. There are many needs, but the need does not justify the call. In other words, just because something should be done doesn't mean that God wants you to do it. We need, we need to stay close to Jesus so that by his Spirit, he will lead us into the thoughts and the actions that he wants for us. Knowing God's will specifically for us, and we can't do everything, will be a byproduct of being close to him through the word of God in prayer. Then you will hear his voice, as the Old Testament says. You will hear him say in a still small voice, this is the way, walk therein. And you won't even know that you're being led by God. These people who say, well, God told me, God showed me, God directed me. You have no idea. What, what is it that indicates to you that you are getting a direct word from the Holy Spirit? What is it? What's the indicator? Does a neon sign with an arrow flash before your eyes? What goes on? Does a red light turn on in your brain and you see it with your inner eyes? I mean, how do you know? You don't know while you're doing it. You just stay close with the Lord. Don't have any unconfessed sins in your life. And he's leading you. And then afterwards you look back and say, oh, yeah, God was leading me. I see it. The Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordained by God. People who say, God told me, God showed me, God led me. You know what they're trying to do? They're try I don't know. I'm not going to judge their motives, but I think a lot of them are trying to sound super spiritual. If you're walking with the Lord, God leads you. And if you stay close to him and you don't have any unconfessed sin your, sins in your life, God will lead you. He will show you. <clears throat> and when you look back at the end of your life, you say, oh, yeah. I can see how God was leading me. And then he will show you what your priorities need to be. And it won't be to do everything for everyone. There are many needs. But the, needs did not, the need does not justify the call. Just stay close to Christ and his spirit will lead you into what he wants you to do, what he wants you to say, where he wants you to go. And so notice the reaction of Jesus to all these needy people who were looking for him, wanting him. Notice his reaction to them in verse 38. And he said unto them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth again. There were many people with many needs, right where Jesus was. He could have stayed there probably for days and healed them and cast out demons and teach them the word of God. No doubt he could have stayed there and not ever be without an audience. But he said that he had to go and preach the word of God in other places. And you know what that means? That means some people, and in this case, many people, are going to be disappointed. We cannot please everyone all the time. And we shouldn't feel like a failure because we cannot. Our focus should be that of Christ, which was to please God. Make that your priority, to please God. If we please God, 
then we will, as a byproduct, please those who God wants us to please. And, you know, he will find some way to take care of the rest. I'm very for I consider myself very fortunate because I know what I'm called to do. I know why I'm on earth. The overriding reason why I am on earth is to teach the Word of God, and it has been for over 30 years. I've known that. I don't have any doubts about it. That's why I'm here. I, I'm not capable of doing anything else, and I'm not even capable of doing that. But God has called me, and he has supplied what I need. But it's nice to know what God has called you to do because then anything that interferes with that or would seek to derail that, you reject, no matter how much you may want it, no matter how nice it would be. If you put God first, you're going to follow him. That's, that can, not just with me, that can be the case with all of us. Because if you stay close to Jesus, then you will know what his priorities for you are. And you follow those priorities, no matter what it may cost no matter how much you may have to sacrifice, and no matter who you may have to disappoint. 39. <clears throat> and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. He preached in all their synagogues. One synagogue at a time. One town at a time. Because he was only one person in one human body, which was a big change for the Son of God. You know, in eternity past, from forever in the past, the Son of God, because He is God, was everywhere at the same time, just like the Father, just like the Holy Spirit. But that changed forever. That changed permanently the second that Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb. From that point on, the Son of God has been confined to his physical body, to that one physical body. Where is he today? Well, he's all over the world. No, he isn't. He is seated where? At the right hand of the Father. Why? Because he's in that one physical body. Now, his spirit is in every Christian. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, those words are used interchangeably in that sense. But the Son of God is confined to that human body. And so, here we see Jesus going from one town to another and one synagogue to another. He was like a single aspirin in the middle of two million headaches. Verse 40. <clears throat> And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Poor fella. You know, the leprosy spoken of here and in the Bible, elsewhere, was a disfiguring disease and an extremely <clears throat> contagious disease as well. In fact, it was so contagious that lepers had to live in their own little groups called leper colonies away from the rest of the world. In fact, <clears throat> if they came within 50 feet of someone, they were required to yell out, unclean, unclean. And sometimes, if they got too close, some people would throw rocks at them. And so, a leper was cut off from everyone and everything that they loved. And they had nothing in this world to look forward to either because there was no cure. But, Let's read verse 40 again. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, 
put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. This leper had the right attitude as he approached the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that because he came to Jesus with faith in our Lord's ability to do the impossible, but he came with humility as well. He said, Jesus, if you are willing, there's the humility, and there's also trust. He said, Jesus, if you are willing, you can do this. And Jesus said, I'm willing, and he healed him. And what a lesson we can learn from this leper. And don't think his situation wasn't desperate. It was desperate. And yet he still left the outcome of his prayer up to Jesus. A person should always pray with faith and also with humility, knowing that God can do anything he wants to do and always trusting that he will do what's best. Anything less than that dishonors the Lord. You know, faith is not confessing that God will give us what we want every time we pray. Faith is praying, knowing that God hears us and that he, and that he can do anything but also it means trusting that he has done the right thing, even if the answer is no. That's great faith. Great faith is not believing God for him to give me exactly what I want. That's not great faith. I don't know what that is, but that's not great faith. That's, that's a word of faith fraud is what that is. Great faith is praying to God, knowing in your heart that he can do anything and no plan and purpose of his can be thwarted according to the word of God, but also trusting that he's going to do what's best even if it's not your first choice and being okay with it. That's faith. That's living by faith. That's great faith. Forty-one again. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. So, the power of Jesus healed this leper, but it was the compassion of Jesus that caused him to use his power. It was the compassion of Christ that caused him to be kind to those who others sometimes threw rocks at. And to be like Christ we should be kind to those who others ignore. I hate cliques in churches. I hate cliques in churches that claim to be Bible-believing. If anything should not be in a church like that, it should be a clique where you give preferential treatment to quote-unquote professionals and the other people who, hey, who do menial labor are seen as second-class Christians. And don't tell me that doesn't happen. I've seen it. It should never be the case. If you want to be like Jesus, then you need to be kind and show as much respect for people who other people look down upon. And it's always good to remember, too, when we pray, that we are talking to a compassionate God. Like this leper was. His compassion doesn't vary either. That's good to remember. So if, he, so if he says no to our request, it's not because he doesn't care. It certainly isn't because he doesn't have the power to follow through. It's not because he's lacking compassion. It's because it's what's best for us in the long run. 42. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, 
and he was cleansed. So the man was healed. The very second Jesus said, you are healed. Immediately he was a new man. That means he got back his body, he got back his life, he got back his family, he got back his home, he got back his job, he got back everything. Totally. And I love 43. And he, Jesus, strictly charged him and forthwith sent him away. What did he charge him? What did he command him to do? 44. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, and for a testimony unto them. Now, according, this is brilliant, of Jesus. According to the Old Testament law that God gave Moses, the priest was to examine those who suspected that they might have leprosy. And if they did, the priest would make it official and then quarantine that person. The priest was the one who said, you are a leper. And also, at least in theory, the priest pronounced a person cleansed from leprosy. And I say in theory because the disease was incurable Nobody ever recovered. But in theory, that's the way it was supposed to be. So with that in mind, picture Jesus and this leper and this priest in this situation. Picture this situation. This man goes to the priest as Jesus instructed him. And the priest examines him. And the priest probably recognizes him. Yeah, I remember pronouncing you a leper. Everybody knows you are a leper. Sure. Sure. So the priest examines him. The priest says, you don't have leprosy anymore. Never seen anything like this in my life. I can't believe you are healed of an incurable disease. How in the world did that happen? And you know what the man says? Exactly what Jesus told him to say. Jesus of Nazareth did it. He spoke it. And it happened. And the priest is then brought face to face with a genuine miracle one that he confirmed a miracle that Jesus performed. And remember, the priests, along with the other religious leaders, did not like Jesus, so they never wanted to give him any good publicity. But like it or not, he would get it from this priest anyway, if the leper follows the Lord's instructions, which, notice 45. But he went out and began to publish it much. And to spread abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was out in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Jesus wanted to enter cities and calmly teach the word of God in the synagogues. But thanks, at least in part, to this man's misguided zeal, that plan is shot. Now, God's eternal purposes will be fulfilled, often in spite of his people. It's a good thing that God has many plan Bs, because every single time God's people disobey him, at least from our perspective, he has to pull out and use a plan B. Well, I'm out of time. Continue studying, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at the thebibleverseverse.com. Click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's how simple it is. Study all the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation. 30-plus years of archive studying and teaching from me are there for you at the thebibleversebyverse.com. So you can go through the whole Bible, take you the rest of your life maybe, Three complete series going through the Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Make use of it, would you? The Word of God is the most important thing on earth. Please remember that I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. Never have. Never have been. Always been a faith ministry. I just teach the Word of God and trust that God will raise up people to support this ministry, to pray for me. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, Please pray for me. Pray for the word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. 
I would appreciate that. I think God would too. Until next time, so long, everyone.